Okay. Today is the 15th of uh, August, uh, and we come to uh, Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 66, Latu Kiko Pama Sutta, the simile of the quail. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of the Anguttarapans at a town of theirs named Apana. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Apana for arms. When he had wandered for arms in Apana and had returned from his arms round, after his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. When it was morning, <clears throat> the Venerable Udayan dressed, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he too went into Apana for arms. When he had wandered for arms in Apana and had returned from his arms round, after his meal, he went to the same grove for the day's abiding. Having entered the grove, he sat down at the root of a tree for the day's abiding. Then, while the Venerable Udayan was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. How many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Then when it was evening, the Venerable Udayan rose from meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told him, Here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in my mind. How many, painful how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Venerable Sir, formerly we used to eat in the evening, in the morning, and during the day, outside the proper time. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that daytime meal outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, Faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day, outside the proper time. Yet the Blessed One tells us to abandon it. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Out of love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that daytime meal outside the proper time. Then we ate only in the evening and in the morning. Then there was an occasion when the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, please abandon that night meal, which is outside the proper time. Venerable Sir, I was upset and sad, thinking, the Blessed One tells us to abandon the more sumptuous of our two meals. The Sublime One tells us to relinquish it. Once, Venerable Sir, a certain man had obtained some soup during the day, and he said, Put that aside, and we will all eat it together in the evening. Nearly all cooking is done at night, little by day. Out of our love and respect for the Blessed One, and out of shame and fear of wrongdoing, we abandoned that night meal, which was outside the proper time. Stop here for a moment. So this monk, uh, having uh, followed the Buddha's instructions for many years, uh, then one day he was thinking, uh, the, the Buddha has been very, been a very good teacher, uh, and uh, because of the, the Buddha, uh, he has got rid of many painful states. Uh, and obtained many pleasant states, uh, got rid of many unwholesome states, uh, and acquired many wholesome states. Uh, uh. So <clears throat> he was thinking uh, that uh, last time the monks used to eat three meals a day. Then there was a time when the Buddha said, uh, uh, stop the afternoon meal. Uh. Uh, at first he found it very difficult to, to let go of this afternoon meal. Uh, uh because uh, the afternoon and night meals uh, are better than the morning. La morning, uh, usually lay people don't have enough time to cook. La, uh. And then later the Buddha said abandon the night meal also. Again, he was very upset, la, but because he was a very uh, good disciple, la, even though it was difficult to do, uh, he had faith in the Buddha. La, and out of love and respect for the Buddha, uh, 
uh, he did what the Buddha instructed. Lah. It has happened, Venerable Sir, that monks wandering for arms in the thick darkness of the night have walked into a cesspool, cesspit, fallen into a sewer, walked into a thorn bush and fallen over a sleeping cow. They have met hoodlums who, who had already committed a crime and those planning one, and they have been sexually enticed by women. Once, Venerable Sir, I went for wandering for arms in the thick darkness of the night. A woman washing a pot saw me by a flash of lightning and screamed out in terror, Mercy me, a devil has come for me. I told her, Sister, I am no devil, I am a monk waiting for arms. And she said, Then it's a monk whose ma has died and whose pa has died. Better monk that you get your belly cut open with a sharp butcher's knife than this prowling for arms for your belly's sake in the thick darkness of the night. Venerable Sir, when I recollected that, I thought, how many painful states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many pleasant states has the Blessed One brought us? How many unwholesome states has the Blessed One rid us of? How many wholesome states has the Blessed One brought us? Stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, when they used to walk for arms at night, uh, all of these things happened, uh, fell into a cesspit, uh, uh, and a sewer, uh, this uh, full of shit, uh, and uh, walked into a thorn bush, fell over a sleeping cow, and met hoodlums, uh, and sexual, sexually enticed by women at night. Uh, and then uh, this instance uh, when you know, monks, when they beg for food, uh, they are not supposed to open their mouth, uh, not supposed to ask. Uh. So she's, he just stood beside this woman who was washing this pot, uh, still standing there quietly. Uh, the woman didn't know he was there uh, until there was a flash of lightning. Suddenly <laughs> saw him, uh, got so frightened. Uh. After that, cursed him. <laughs> so he said, uh, uh, so the Buddha has rid them of many painful states. Uh, uh and quite many pleasant states. Some of these Buddha's instructions are initially uh, is, uh, for, for a person not used to it, uh, you'll f find it uh, very hard to practice, uh, like eating one meal a day or eating two meals a day, uh, not having your dinner. But when you get used to it, uh, then you realize it is sufficient. And then you realize uh, you are the better for it uh, because you are more healthy. Uh, eating too much, uh, uh, you will not be healthy. Uh. So to Dain, <clears throat> there are certain misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, what, such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting, and they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough and rotting tether, and a thick yoke. Suppose Udayan, a quail were tethered by a rotting creeper, and would thereby expect injury, captivity, or death. Now suppose someone said, the rotting creeper by which that quail is tethered, and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death, is for her a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, verbal sir, for that quail, the rotting creeper by which she is tethered and thereby expects injury, captivity, or death is a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and the thick yoke. So too, Udayan, there are certain mis misguided men here who, when told by me, abandon this. They say, what? Such a mere trifle, such a little thing as this? This recluse is much too exacting, and they do not abandon that, and they show discourtesy towards me as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. I'll stop here for a moment. Eh? So the Buddha is saying, eh, uh, sometimes the Buddha makes a precept eh, and certain monks, eh, they, they think it's such a small thing why the, the Buddha uh, make this precept, eh, don't allow them this and that. Eh. So they don't follow, and when they don't follow, this, uh, this becomes a, a, a problem for them. Uh, just like a, a strong, 
uh, tough, uh, unrotting tether, thick yoke. Lah. And the Buddha gives a simile of a quail, lah, a, a, a kind of bird, lah, which is caught by this uh, rotting creeper. Lah. Uh, if, if, you, if a human were caught by this rotting creeper, uh, we can easily break it. Lah. But for this quail, uh, because it's so small, uh, uh, that rotting creeper uh, is a strong, stout uh, bond uh, and she cannot escape from it. Uh, so she will either uh, be captured uh, or die there. Uh. So in the same way, the Buddha says, uh, when, a, when a monk... Uh, does not follow the instructions uh, of the Buddha, uh, and that becomes a big problem for him. Uh. Udain, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this, say, what? Such a mere trifle, such a little thing to be abandoned as this? The Blessed One tells us to abandon. The sublime One tells us to relinquish. Yet they abandon that and do not show this courtesy towards me or towards those monks, the desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with a mind as aloof as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Suppose Udain, a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle, were tethered by stout leather thongs, but by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst the thongs and then go where he likes. Now suppose someone said, the stout leather thongs by which this royal tusker elephant is tethered are for him a strong, stout, tough and rotting tether and a thick yoke. Would he be speaking rightly? No, verbal sir. The stout leather thongs by which that royal tusker elephant is tethered, which by simply twisting his body a little, he could break and burst and then go where he likes are for him a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. So too, Dain, there are certain clansmen here who, when told by me, abandon this, uh, and they abandon that, and do not show discourtesy towards me or towards those monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsisting on others' gifts, with mine as aloof as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Uh, so here the Buddha gives the converse la, uh, sometimes a monk is told to follow certain instructions uh, he may not like it la, but out of uh, love and respect for the Buddha they comply la, uh, so then uh, there is no uh, uh, they, have, they have no problem la. they they uh, this 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 precept doesn't ma make any problem for them la. Uh, just like this uh, uh, king's elephant uh, is so strong uh, even it's bound by a tough leather uh, you can simply break it la. Uh, so it all depends on our mind if the mind is strong uh, it can overcome anything uh, this attitude uh, our attitude is very important uh, there's one sutta, if you all remember, uh, last year we did the Sangyutta Nikaya and then the Buddha gave this uh, example that uh, Sakadeva Raja uh, went to war with the Asuras and then uh, Sakadeva Raja won and then the Asura chieftain uh, was tied up, his hands and feet were tied uh, and he was brought to the Deva city uh. and then <coughs> the Buddha said, um, if when he was brought to the, uh, in captivity uh, to the Deva city, uh, he, if his attitude was uh, that uh, that uh, Sakadeva Raja was wrong uh, and they were right uh, in the battle uh, and um, he shouldn't be uh, caught uh, in captivity and all that, uh, then he'll be feeling uh, a lot of suffering. Uh. He cannot accept the fact that he is shackled up, uh, tied up. Uh. But on the other hand, uh, if his attitude uh, was that uh, they were wrong to start the battle, uh, that uh, Sakadeva Raja and the Devas were correct. Uh, so uh, even though he's uh, tied up uh, and brought as a prisoner, uh, he doesn't mind it. Uh. Uh, so for him, uh, because of that attitude, uh, when he's uh, brought as a prisoner to the Devasity, uh, he's not 
he does not suffer mentally la. he accepts it la. Uh, so our attitude uh, in life uh, is very important so like in this case uh, like the Buddha says uh, the Buddha says uh, makes a certain precept la. Uh, there are certain monks uh, who think uh, it's such a small thing and they refuse to comply uh, f- uh, for them that becomes a big problem la. Uh, uh, just like some people uh, uh, certain things uh, they think uh, precept uh, uh, it's not necessary to follow. Uh, mm. And on the other hand, uh, there are some monk disciples of the Buddha, uh, they also think that it's a small thing, uh, but because they have love and respect for the Buddha, and also they think the Buddha is wiser than them, uh, they comply. Uh, and then after that, uh, later uh, they realize uh, the Buddha uh, is actually wiser than them. That's why, like earlier, the example, uh, the, when the Buddha stop them from eating the afternoon meal and eating the night meal. Uh, at first, uh, they were not happy, but later in the long run, uh, then they realized uh, the Buddha made the, the, uh, gave the wise instruction. Suppose Udayin, <clears throat> there were a poor, penniless, destitute man, and he had one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and some grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and one hag of a wife, not the best kind. He might see a monk in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed after he had eaten a delicious meal, devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think, how pleasant the recluse's state is, how healthy the recluse's state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. But being unable to abandon his one dilapidated hovel open to the crows, not the best kind, and his one dilapidated wicker bedstead, not the best kind, and his grain and pumpkin seeds in a pot, not the best kind, and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, he is unable to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said, the tethers by which a man, the tethers by which that man is tethered, so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel, etc., and his hag of a wife, not of the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a feeble, weak, rotten, tallest tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir. The tethers by which that man is tethered so that he cannot abandon his one dilapidated hovel, etc., and his hag of a wife, not the best kind, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. So too, Dain, there are certain misguided men here, who, when told by me, abandon this, do not abandon that, and they show this courtesy towards me as well as towards those monks desirous of training. For them, that thing becomes a strong, stout, tough, and rotting tether and a thick yoke. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, the Buddha gives this uh, example uh, of this poor man. Uh. He's got this uh, dilapidated uh, house and uh, bed and... Uh, uh, pumpkin seeds, uh, uh, and a hag of a wife. Uh, that's uh, that's all he owns, uh, and he sees the monk uh, so uh, happy, uh, having renounced everything, uh, having a good meal, and can devote his time to meditation. No stress, etc. No worries. Uh, no uh, uh, creditor chasing him. Uh, uh, he's not in debt, etc. And so he envies that monk. But because he cannot let go, uh, even all this, uh, um, the poor state he's in, uh, he still cannot let go. Uh, so that becomes a, a strong uh, bond for him. Uh. Suppose Udain, there were a rich householder or a householder's son with great wealth and property, with a vast number of gold ingots, a vast number of granaries, a vast number of fields, a vast amount of land, a vast number of wives, and a vast number of men and women slaves. He might see a monk in a monastery park, sitting in the shade of a tree, his hands and feet well washed, after he had eaten a delicious meal, 
devoting himself to the higher mind. He might think how pleasant the reclusive state is, how healthy the reclusive state is. If only I could shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. And being able to abandon his vast number of gold ingots, his vast number of granaries, his vast number of fields, his vast amount of land, his vast number of wives, and his vast number of men and women slaves, he is able to shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. Now suppose someone said, the tethers by which that householder or householder's son is tethered, so that he can abandon his vast number of gold ingots, etc., his vast number of men and women slaves, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a strong, stout, tough, unrotting tether. Would he be speaking rightly? No, venerable sir, the tethers by which that householder or householder's son is tethered, so that he can abandon his vast number of gold ingots, his etc. His vast number of men and women slaves, and shave off his hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and go forth from the home life into homelessness. For him, those are a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. So too, Udayan, there are certain clansmen here, who, when told by me, abandon this, abandon that, and do not show discourtesy towards me, or towards those monks desirous of training. Having abandoned it, they live at ease, unruffled, subsistence, <clears throat> subsisting on others' gifts, with mine as aloof as a wild deer's. For them, that thing becomes a feeble, weak, rotting, callous tether. Stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha gives the converse example of a very rich man with a vast amount of property and wives and slaves, etc. But even then, with so much property and wives, he still can let go of everything and renounce. So for him, all those things are not a strong bond. So here it shows just the state of the mind. If your mind is strong, it doesn't matter how much property you have. If your mind is weak, like the earlier example, the poor, penniless, destitute man in that dilapidated uh, house and uh, wicker bed and, and and only property he has is green and pumpkin seeds in a pot uh, and a hang of a wife. Uh, still, he cannot let go. Uh. Udayan, there are four kinds of persons to be found existing in the world. What are the four? Here, Udayan, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, Memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him. He tolerates them. He does not abandon them, remove them, do away with them, and annihilate them. Such a person I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, Memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him. He does not tolerate them. He abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Such a person, too, I call fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person practices the way to the abandoning of attachment, to the relinquishing of attachment. When he is practicing the way, Memories and intentions associated with attachment beset him now and then through lapses of mindfulness. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Just as if a man were to let two or three drops of water fall onto an iron plate heated for a whole day, the, the falling of the water drops might be slow, but they would quickly vaporize and vanish. So too, here some person practices the way, etc. His mindfulness may be slow in arising, but he quickly abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. Such a person too are called fettered, not unfettered. Why is that? Because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. Here, Udain, some person, having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, divests himself of attachment and is liberated with the destruction of attachment. Such a person I call unfettered, not fettered. Why is that? 
because I have known the particular diversity of faculties in this person. I stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha is talking about four types of persons. Uh. When he's practicing the spiritual path, uh, uh, memories of the home life, uh, uh, all the attachments uh, uh, beset him. Uh, and then uh, he tolerates them. Uh. Uh, if he tolerates them, uh, he is not going to succeed uh, in any way. Uh. Mm, very soon he'll go back to the lay life. Uh. The second person, uh, uh, these memories come and haunt him, uh, but he does not tolerate them. Uh. He removes them, uh, does away with them. The third one, uh, now and then it comes to... Um, uh, so the second one is better. The third one, uh, now and then uh, these uh, memories uh, from the home life come to disturb him. Uh. And, but he uh, he gets rid of them. Uh. Uh, so these three, uh, they, he's, the, they still has not uh, removed uh, attachment. Uh. Attachment still comes to disturb him. Uh. Only the last one, uh, uh, he, has, uh, he has liberated uh, uh, and destroyed attachment. Uh. There are Udain, five cords of sensual pleasure. What are the five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, Udain, the pleasure and joy <clears throat> that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure, a filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ignoble pleasure. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should not be pursued, that it should not be developed, that it should not be cultivated, that it should be feared. I stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha is talking about the five chords of sensual pleasure, huh? namely uh, worldly pleasure, lah. Uh, the uh, pleasure and joy uh, we get uh, because of beautiful forms, sounds, smells, tastes and touch. Uh, and the Buddha calls this a uh, uh, filthy pleasure, cause pleasure, ignoble pleasure. And should not be cultivated, uh, should be feared uh, because it results in suffering. Uh, uh, all these... Uh, uh, worldly pleasures we engage in, uh, uh, it gives us pleasure for a short time uh, and then uh, uh, it's followed by craving uh, and attachment. Uh, and when we, because everything is impermanent, uh, when we cannot get it, uh, uh, then grief will arise, uh, uh, grief and covetousness. Uh, mm. Here, Udain, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away as well of delight, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. This is called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, that it should be cultivated, that it should not be feared. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the Buddha makes a very clear distinction. These two types of pleasure, worldly pleasure, should not be uh, pursuit uh, should not be cultivated, uh, it should be feared uh, because it results in suffering. Uh. But the, 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 the bliss and the, the joy and the happiness uh, that comes from uh, the first jhana, the second jhana, third and fourth jhana, the Buddha calls it uh, the bliss of renunciation, uh, bliss of peace, uh, enlightenment. Uh. And this type of pleasure, the Buddha says, uh, should be pursued, uh, should be developed, should be cultivated should not be feared. So nowadays, a lot of people, they don't understand. They say you can be attached to jhana, you should not be attached to jhana. But the Buddha is telling us, go ahead and be attached to jhana, enjoy jhana, because it has four good results. Sotapanna, Sakadagamin, Anagamin, and Arahanhut, the stated in some sutta.
Here you dine, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. Now this, I say, belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The applied thought and sustained thought that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. Now this, I say, also belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The delight and pleasure that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the fading away as well of delight, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. Now this, I say, also belongs to the perturbable. And what therein belongs to the perturbable? The equanimity and pleasure that have not ceased therein. That is what belongs to the perturbable. Here Udain, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. Now this, I say, belongs to the imperturbable. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here the Buddha distinguishes... Uh, uh, these uh, four jhanas, uh, the first three the Buddha calls perturbable, uh, shakeable. Uh. Why? Because uh, in the first jhana, you still have thoughts. Uh, and these thoughts uh, are the, this is, uh, this is applied and sustained thought. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, the cause uh, for, for it being perturbable, uh, the first jhana. And the second one, uh, the second jhana, the Piti and sukha, delight and pleasure, uh, is the cause from, for, for it to be said to be perturbable. The third jhana is the equanimity and pleasure uh, that causes it to be perturbable. But in the fourth jhana, uh, it is said to enter the fourth jhana, the monk has to abandon pleasure and pain, uh, grief and joy before he can enter the fourth jhana. And the fourth jhana is said to be um, imperturbable, uh, unshakable. Uh, it's a very deep state. Uh. Here Udain, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. That, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udain, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udain, with the fading away as well of delight, a monk enters upon and abides in the third jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here Udain, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, with the complete surmounting of, perce of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite space. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. That surmounts it. But that too, I say, is not enough. Abandon it, I say. Surmount it, I say. And what surmounts it? Here, Udain, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That surmounts it. Thus I speak of the abandoning even of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. You see, Udain, any factor, small or great, of whose abandoning I do not speak. No, Venerable Sir. That is what the Blessed One said. Remember, Udain was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. It's the end of the sutta. So, 
here this last part uh, you can see you can see uh, that the Buddha encourages his monks uh, to attain uh, up to the highest uh, uh, the cessation of perception and feeling uh, when a monk can attain that state uh, when he comes out of it uh, he can become liberated uh, uh. So the example given in this sutta about the poor destitute man uh, with a broken down house and a dilapidated bed and all that uh, and a hang of a wife, uh, even in such a poor uh, situation, uh, yet uh, he cannot give up, cannot renounce. On the other hand, uh, the rich man uh, with so many wives and property and slaves, uh, he can give up everything. Uh, and renounce, become a monk. Uh, so it all depends on our state of mind. Uh, that's why uh, uh, this uh, determination, aditana, determination is very important. If we do things uh, half-heartedly, uh, we will never succeed in anything. Uh, but if our mind is very strong, uh, then anything uh, we can overcome. I remember reading somewhere, the Buddha said, uh, if a person, uh, if your determination is so strong, uh, uh, even the devas uh, cannot uh, hinder you. Uh. For example, when the Buddha was uh, striving for enlightenment, uh, Mara was uh, trying to obstruct him. Uh, and yet, uh, Mara was so powerful, uh, also could not obstruct the Buddha from attaining enlightenment because the Buddha's determination was too great. Uh. Now we come to Sutta 67. Chatuma Sutta at Chatuma. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Chatuma in a Myrobalan grove. Now on that occasion, 500 monks headed by the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahamogalana had come to Chatuma to see the Blessed One. While the visiting monks were exchanging greetings with the resident monks and were preparing resting places and putting away their bowls and outer robes, they were very loud and noisy. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda thus, Ananda, who are these loud, noisy people? One would think they were fishermen hawking fish. Venerable Sir, there are 500 monks headed by Sariputta and Moglana who have come to Chatuma to see the Blessed One. And while the visiting monks were exchanging greetings with the resident monks and were preparing resting places and putting away their bowls and outer robes, they have been very loud and noisy. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, uh, Venerable uh, Sariputta and Mahamogulana, the right hand and left hand disciples of the Buddha, the closest disciples of the Buddha, came with 500 monks uh, to pay their respect to the Buddha. And when they uh, met uh, the resident monks uh, in this monastery, they uh, uh, they were exchanging greetings uh, and preparing resting places and putting away their bowls uh, and uh, they were a bit and loud and noisy. Uh. Then Ananda, tell those monks in my name that the teacher calls the Venerable Ones. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied. And he went to those monks and told them, the teacher calls the Venerable Ones. Yes, friend, they replied. And they went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. When they had done so, the Blessed One asked them, Monks, why are you so loud and noisy? One would think you were fishermen, hawking fish. Remember, sir, we are 500 monks headed by Sariputta and Mogalana who have come to Chatuma to see the Blessed One. And it was while we, we visiting monks were exchanging greetings with the resident monks and were preparing resting places and putting away our bowls and outer robes that we were very loud and noisy. And the Buddha said, Go, monks, I dismiss you. You cannot live with me. Yes, Venerable Sir, they replied. And they rose from their seats, and after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on their right, they put away the things in their resting places, and taking their bowls and outer robes, they departed. Stop here for a moment. So you see the character of the Buddha. He likes uh, quiet. 
cannot tolerate uh, noise. Uh. So even though his closest disciples are here to see him, uh, pay respect to him, uh, he asked them to go away. Uh. So and, and they, without questioning him, uh, they just complied. Uh. Now on that occasion, the Sakyans of Chatuma had met together in the assembly hall for some business or other. Seeing the monks coming in the distance, they went to them and asked, Where are you going, Venerable Sirs? Friends, the Sangha of monks has been dismissed by the Blessed One. And they said, Then let the Venerable Ones be seated a while. Perhaps we shall be able to restore his confidence. Yes, friends, they replied. Then the Sakyans of Chatuma went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and said, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One delight in the Sangha of monks. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One welcome the Sangha of monks. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One show compassion towards the Sangha of monks, now as he used to show compassion towards it in the past. Venerable Sir, there are new monks here, just gone forth, recently come to this Dhamma Vinaya. If they get no opportunity to see the Blessed One, there may take place in them some change or alteration. Venerable Sir, just as when young seedlings get no water, there may take place in them some change or alteration. So too, Venerable Sir, there are new monks here, just gone forth, recently come to this Dhamma Vinaya. If they get no opportunity to see the Blessed One, there may take place in them some change or alteration. Venerable Sir, just as when a young calf does not see its mother, there may take place in it some change or alteration. So too, Venerable Sir, there are new monks here, just gone forth, recently come to this Dhamma Vinaya. If they get no opportunity to see the Blessed One, there may take, there may take place in them some change or alteration. Remember, Sir, let the Blessed One delight in the Sangha of monks. Remember, Sir, let the Blessed One welcome the Sangha of monks. Remember, Sir, let the Blessed One show compassion towards the Sangha of monks, now as He used to show compassion towards it in the past. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here you see uh, these uh, lay devotees, uh, when they realize the monks have been dismissed by the Buddha, uh, then they appeal to the Buddha, uh, even asking the Buddha to show compassion. Uh. Then the Brahma Sahampati knew with his mind the thought in the Blessed One's mind. So just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flex arm or flex his extended arm, he vanished in the Brahma world and appeared before the Blessed One. Then he arranged his upper robe on one shoulder and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, he said, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One delight in the Sangha of monks. Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One welcome the Sangha of monks. Venerable Sir, uh, let the Blessed One show compassion towards the Sangha of monks, now as he used to show compassion towards the Sangha of monks in the past. Uh, then uh, the Sakyans of Chatuma and the Brahma Sahampati were able to restore the Blessed One's confidence with the similes of the seedlings and the young calf. Then the Venerable Maha Moglan addressed the monks thus, Get up, friends, take your bowls and outer robes. The Blessed One's confidence has been restored by the Sakyans of Chatuma and the Brahma Sahampati with the similes of the seedlings and the young calf. Yes, friend, they replied, and taking their bowls and outer robes, they went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So you see, uh, this uh, Brahma Sahampati, uh, uh, in some sutta is mentioned uh, that he was a monk in a previous life. Uh. So he also was following very closely uh, the events uh, um, in, in India at this time. Uh. And um, when he realized uh, that the Buddha had dismissed the Sangha of monks, uh, he also came to appeal to the Buddha in the very same way uh, that the uh, lay devotees had appealed. Uh, and so the Buddha uh, decided uh, to, to accept the, the Sangha of monks. Uh. And this Venerable Maha Moglana, his uh, psychic power is so great, uh, immediately uh, he knew that the Buddha has changed his mind already, so he told the monks, uh, let's go back. <laughs> <clears throat> Even the Buddha's mind, uh, he can read. Uh, mm. When they had done so, the Blessed One asked the Venerable Sariputta, what did you think, Sariputta, when the Sangha of monks was dismissed by me? 
Venerable Sir, I thought thus, the Sangha of monks has been dismissed by the Blessed One. The Blessed One will now abide in active, devoted to pleasant abiding here and now. And we too shall abide in active, devoted to pleasant abiding here and now. Stop, Sariputta, stop. Such a thought should not be entertained by you again. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, this member Sariputta is saying, uh, when, uh, when the Buddha dismissed the Sangha of monks, uh, he thought uh, the Buddha wants to abide in peace and quiet lah, in, in the jhanas. Lah. So he thought uh, he also will do the same. Lah. They will also do the same. Lah. And the Buddha said, uh, 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 that's, that's not correct. Nah. You should not think in this way. Nah. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Maha Moglana. What did you think, Moglana, when the Sangha of monks was dismissed by me? Venerable Sir, I thought thus, the Sangha of monks has been dismissed by the Blessed One. The Blessed One will now re- abide inactive, devoted to pleasant abiding here and now. Now the Venerable Sariputta and I shall lead the Sangha of monks. Good, good, Moglana. Either I shall lead the Sangha of monks or else Sariputta and Moglana shall lead it. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here uh, the Buddha um, is saying uh, that if he um, abides in active, uh, abides in, in meditation, uh, then either Venerable Sariputta or Moglana should lead the Sangha. Uh. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, there are these four kinds of fears to be expected by those who go down to the water. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the Buddha is uh, giving a Dhamma teaching uh, to these monks. Uh. There are four kinds of fears to be expected by those who go down to the water. What are the four? They are fear of waves, fear of crocodiles, fear of whirlpools, and fear of sharks. These are the four kinds of fears to be expected by those who go down to the water. So two monks, there are four kinds of fears to be expected by certain persons who have gone forth from the home life into homelessness in this Dhamma Vinaya. What are the four? They are fear of waves, fear of crocodiles, fear of whirlpools and fear of sharks. What monks is fear of waves? Here some clansman goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering, I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Then after he has gone forth thus, his companions in the holy life advise him and instruct him thus, you should move to and fro thus, you should look ahead and look away thus, you should flex and extend, extend the limbs thus. You should wear the patch cloak, bowl and ropes thus. Then he thinks, formerly when we were in the home life, we advised and instructed others. And now these monks who seem like they might be our sons or our grandsons think that they can advise and instruct us. And so he forsakes the training and reverts to the lower life. He is called one who has forsaken the training and reverted to the lower life because he was frightened by the fear of waves. Now, waves is a term for angry despair. Stop here for a moment. This refers to uh, old people uh, who come into monkhood. uh. Old people, when they come into monkhood, uh, they have been used to a position of authority, uh, especially. uh. And then when they are taught by young monks, uh, you should do this, you should not do that, uh, then they get angry. uh. You think, uh, who are these, these youngsters? Uh, they can be our sons or our grandsons uh, and t- trying to teach us. So they get angry and they disrobe. Uh. What monks is fear of crocodiles? Here some clansman goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering, I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Then after he has gone forth thus, his companions in the holy life advise and instruct him thus. This can be consumed by you. This cannot be consumed by you. This can be eaten by you. This cannot be eaten by you. This can be tasted by you. This cannot be tasted by you. This can be drunk by you. This cannot be drunk by you. You consume you can consume what is allowable. You cannot consume what is not allowable. You can eat what is allowable. You cannot eat what is not allowable. You can taste what is allowable. You cannot taste what is not allowable. 
You can drink what is allowable. You cannot drink what is not allowable. You can see, you can consume food within the proper time. You cannot consume food outside the proper time. You can eat within the proper time. You cannot eat outside the proper time. You can taste food within the proper time. You cannot taste food outside the proper time. You can drink within the proper time. You cannot drink outside the proper time. Then he thinks, formerly when we were in the home life, we consumed what we liked and did not consume what we did not like. We ate what we liked and did not eat what we did not like. We tasted what we liked and did not taste what we did not like. We, we drank what we liked and did not drink what we did not like. We consumed what was allowable and what was not allowable. We ate what was allowable and what was not allowable. We tasted what was allowable and what was not allowable. We drank what was allowable and what was not allowable. We consumed food within the proper time and outside the proper time. We ate within the proper time and outside the proper time. We tasted food within the proper time and outside the proper time. We drank within the proper time and outside the proper time. Now, when faithful householders give us good food of various kinds during the day, outside the proper time, it seems these monks put a muzzle on our mouths. And so he forsakes the training and reverts to the lower life. He is called one who has forsaken the training and reverted to the lower life because he was frightened by the fear of crocodiles. Now, crocodiles is a term for gluttony. Uh, stop here for a moment. Uh. So here refers to some people uh, who, uh, for whom uh, food uh, and drinks uh, is very important. Uh. So when they are told uh, they uh, can eat certain foods, they cannot eat certain foods, they have to eat at the right time, you cannot eat at the wrong time and all this thing. Uh, and they, they, they cannot tolerate it. Uh. Uh, then uh, because of gluttony, uh, they disrobe. Uh. What monks? This fear of whirlpools. Here some clansman goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering, I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Then after he has gone forth thus, when it is morning he dresses, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he goes into a village or town for arms, with his body unguarded, with his speech unguarded, with mindfulness unestablished, and with sense faculties unrestrained. He sees some householder there, or householder's son, furnished and endowed with the five cords of sensual pleasure, enjoying himself with them. He considers thus, formerly when we were in the home life, we were furnished and endowed with the five cords of sensual pleasure, and we enjoyed ourselves with them. My family has wealth, I can en both enjoy wealth and make merit. And so he forsakes the training and reverts to the low life. He is called one who has forsaken the training and reverted to the low life because he was frightened by the fear of whirlpools. Now whirlpools is a term for the five courts of sensual pleasure. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So this is the third type of monk nah, who he is not, uh, his faculties are not restrained. Nah. Nah. And he goes on arms round, uh, he's looking here and there, his ears are open and all that. Uh. So he sees uh, some layman uh, enjoying himself uh, uh, with the five courts of sensual pleasure. Then he remembers uh, that he used to enjoy all this. And uh, why is it now he cannot enjoy? Uh, so he thinks uh, the family is wealthy. Uh, then he can go back to the lay life uh, and enjoy and at the same time uh, do charity, la, make merit. La. Uh, so he disrobes. La. Uh, what monks is fear of sharks? Here some clansman goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Then after he has gone forth thus, when it is morning, he dresses, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he goes into a village or town for arms, with his body unguarded, with his speech unguarded, with mindfulness unestablished, and with sense faculties unrestrained. He sees a woman there, lightly clothed, lightly dressed. When he sees such a woman, lust infects his mind. Because his mind has been infected by lust, he forsakes the training and reverts to the lower life. He is called one who has forsaken the training and reverted to the low life 
because he was frightened by the fear of sharks. Now, sharks is a term for women. Monks, these are the four kinds of fears to be expected by certain persons who have gone forth from the home life into homelessness in this Dhamma Vinaya. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this last case uh, is uh, somebody who goes on arms round and uh, goes into town uh, and his faculties are not restrained. Uh, and so when he sees uh, some uh, woman uh, and then uh, lust infects his mind uh, and then uh, he disrobes. Uh, uh. So sometimes these examples the Buddha gives uh, is quite humorous also. Uh, mm. Yeah. So, so this sutta, you can see the uh, Buddha's character. He likes peace and quiet. Uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, he gave a Dharma talk to these uh, monks. Uh, probably in the Sangha of monks, you have old monks. Uh, and you have uh, all these type, four types of monks. Uh, so he's telling them to, 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 to guard themselves. No? Uh. Number 68, Nalaka Pana Sutta at Nalaka Pana. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kosalan country at Nalakapana in the Palasa Grove. Now, on that occasion, many very well-known clansmen had gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness under the Blessed One. The Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Nandia, the Venerable Kimbila, the Venerable Bagu, the Venerable Kundadana, the Venerable Revata, the Venerable Ananda, and other very well-known clansmen. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the Buddha is talking about all these uh, monks uh, who come from well-known families, uh, rich families. Uh, 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 so, uh, so these monks, uh, because they have come, gone forth uh, from uh, well-known families, uh, so everybody knows them. Uh. And on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of monks. Then referring to those clansmen, he addressed the monks thus, Monks, those clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness under me, do they delight in the holy life? When this was said, those monks were silent. The second and a third time, referring to those clansmen, he addressed the monks thus, Monks, those clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness under me, do they delight in the holy life? For a second and third time, those monks were silent. Then the Blessed One considered thus, Suppose I question those clansmen. Then he addressed the Venerable Anuruddha thus, Anuruddha, do you all delight in the holy life? And Anuruddha said, Surely, Venerable Sir, we delight in the holy life. Good, good, Anuruddha. It is proper for all you clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to delight in the holy life. As you are still endowed with the blessing of youth, black-haired young men in the prime of life, you could have indulged in sensual pleasures, yet you have gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It is not because you have been driven by kings that you have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, or because you have been driven by thieves, or owing to debt, fear, or want of a livelihood. Rather, did you not go forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness after considering thus, I am a victim of birth, aging, and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. Yes, my brother, sir. Um, so here, the Buddha says, uh, uh, you all have gone forth, uh, uh, also from prominent families, uh, and you have not gone forth because you have been forced to go forth uh, 
uh, by the king or owing to uh, a debt uh, or of a want of a livelihood uh, not because you need to cari makan uh, but because you understand the Dhamma uh, what should be done Anuruddha by a clansman who has gone forth thus while he still does not attain to the delight and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states or to something more peaceful than that covetousness invades his mind and remains ill will invades his mind and remains sloth and torpor invade his mind and remain restlessness and remorse invade his mind and remain doubt invades his mind and remains discontent invades his mind and remains weariness invades his mind and remains that is so while he still does not attain to the delight and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states or to something more peaceful than that when he attains to the delight and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states or to something more peaceful than that covetousness does not in- invade his mind and remain ill will sloth and torpor restlessness and remorse doubt discontent weariness do not invade his mind and remain that is so when he attains to the delight and pleasure that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states or to something more peaceful than that Let's stop here for a moment now this is an extremely important uh, uh, part uh, uh, extremely important sutta here uh, the buddha is saying uh, if a monk uh, has not attained to the delight and pleasure uh, that are secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states this refers to the first jhana uh, in the description of the first jhana the buddha says uh, a monk uh, has to be secluded from sensual pleasures and from unwholesome states uh, before he enters the first jhana uh. so the buddha says uh, here uh, that if a monk has not attained the first jhana or to something more peaceful than that something more peaceful than that refers to the higher jhanas lah jhana number 2 number 3 number 4 the arupas uh, and uh, this uh, cessation of perception and feeling lah uh, so uh, so the, the this part the buddha is saying as long as a monk has not attained to the jhanas uh, these uh, five hindrances lah uh, invade his mind and remain you know uh, covetousness ill will uh, sloth and torpor restlessness and remorse and doubt uh, and even discontent and weariness uh. but when he has attained to the first jhana or to higher jhanas uh, then these things uh, these uh, hindrances uh, do not invade the mind and remain uh. so this is extremely important uh. Uh. so it is only when a monk attains the jhanas uh, that he is rid of the uh, five hindrances uh, and the five hindrances do not remain anymore it's very clear from here you know do not invade the mind and remain uh, uh, it's very clear it's not just uh, uh, during that the, the, the time uh, he's in jhana uh, that he does not have the five hindrances no it's even after that uh, because here it's, it's very clear uh, that uh, the five hindrances do not uh, remain anymore after that uh. How then Anuruddha do you all think of me in this way the tathagata has not abandoned the taints that defile bring renewal of being give trouble ripen in suffering and lead to future birth aging and death that is why the tathagata uses one thing after reflecting endures another thing after reflecting avoids another thing after reflecting and removes another thing after reflecting no verbal sir we do not think that the blessed one we do not think of the blessed one in that way we think of the blessed one in this way the tathagata has abandoned has abandoned the taints that defile bring renewal of being give trouble ripen in suffering and lead to future birth aging and death that is why the tathagata uses one thing after reflecting endures another thing after reflecting avoids another thing after reflecting and removes another thing after reflecting stop here for a moment now. so here uh, the buddha is saying uh, that uh, uh, before using anything uh, the buddha will reflect uh, uh, the buddha 
before he does anything lah, he reflects lah. Uh, then he decides to use something. Or after reflecting lah, he endures another thing. Or after reflecting lah, he thinks it's necessary, he'll avoid another thing. And after reflecting, he thinks it's uh, best, uh, then he removes another thing. Uh, so, whatever we do, uh, we have to reflect uh, carefully. Uh, don't do things blur blur. Uh, for example, some people, uh, when they are uh, all uh, emotionally upset, uh, then they cannot think straight. Uh, uh, then they, they, are, they are not reflecting, uh, they are not thinking straight. How can they make the right decision? Then the Buddha said, Good, good, Anuruddha. The Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. He has cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm stump whose crown is cut off is incapable of future growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, cut them off at the root, Root made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. What do you think, Anuruddha? What purpose does the Tathagata see that when a disciple has died, he declares his reappearance thus? So and so has reappeared in such and such a place. So and so has reappeared in such and such a place. Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. Have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Anuruddha, it is not for the purpose of scheming to deceive people, or for the purpose of flattering people, or for the purpose of gain, honour and renown, or with the thought, let people know me to be thus that when a disciple has died, the Tathagata declares his reappearance thus, so and so has reappeared in such and such a place, so and so has reappeared in such and such a place. Rather, it is because there are faithful clansmen, inspired and gladdened by what is lofty, who, when they hear that, direct their minds to such a state, and that leads to their welfare and happiness for a long time. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here the Buddha is saying, nah, that after his disciples have passed away, uh, he declares uh, that they have been reborn in such and such a heaven, etc. Uh, not because he wants to flatter people uh, or deceive people uh, or to, to, to get uh, gains, honor or renown, uh, but because uh, the uh, devotees, uh, when they hear it, uh, faithful clansmen, uh, uh, they will be inspired uh, and gladdened uh, and, and they will direct their minds to such a state uh, uh, and that will lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. In other words, uh, when they hear uh, of the Buddha's disciples uh, having attained certain stages or reborn in certain places uh, and then they are, they are inspired uh, to follow the same, uh, the same uh, way. Uh, but only the Buddha uh, has this uh, capability uh, of stating uh, his disciples has attained to attain to such and such a state. Uh. And nowadays, uh, we don't have uh, a monk uh, who has that capability. Uh. So uh, monks uh, should not uh, say that the disciples have attained such and such states. Uh. And the Buddha continues, Here a monk hears thus, The monk named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him. He was established in final knowledge. And when he has either seen that Venerable One for himself or heard it said of him, that Venerable One's virtue was thus, his state of concentration was thus, his wisdom was thus, his abiding attainments was thus, his deliverance was thus. Recollecting his faith, virtue, learning, generosity and wisdom, he directs his mind to such a state. In this way, a monk has a comfortable abiding. Here a monk hears thus. Here a monk hears thus. The monk named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, he has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and there will attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. In other words, an Anagamin. And he has either seen the Venerable One for himself, etc. He directs his mind to such a state. In this way, too, a monk has a comfortable abiding. Here a monk hears thus, the monk named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him. With the destruction of three fetters and with the attenuation of lust, hate and delusion, he has become a once-returner, Sakadagamin. 
returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. And he has either seen that venerable one for himself, etc., etc., and he directs his mind to such a state. In this way, too, a monk has a comfortable abiding. Here a monk hears thus, the monk named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him, with the destruction of three fetters, he has become a stream enterer, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment, as Sotapanna. And he has either seen that venerable one for himself, etc. He directs his mind to such a state. In this way, too, a monk has a comfortable abiding. So here, the Buddha is talking about the monk disciples, uh, uh, the Arahan, Anagamin, Sakadagamin, and Sotapanna, the various stages of Aryahood. Uh, and so if uh, a monk hears of this other monk, uh, then he's inspired uh, and he will direct his mind to attain that same state also. Uh. Then the Buddha continues. Here a bhikkhuni, a, a nun, hears thus. The nun named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of her. She was established in final knowledge, that means Arahana. And she has either seen that sister for herself or heard it said of her. That sister's virtue was thus. Her state of concentration was thus. Her wisdom was thus. Her abiding in attainments was thus. Her deliverance was thus. Recollecting her faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and wisdom, she directs her mind to such a state. In this way, too, a nun has a comfortable abiding. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, when this nun uh, hears of uh, Anagamin, Sakadagamin, Sotapanna, nun, uh, then she is also inspired uh, to follow. Uh. Here, a man lay follower hears thus. The man lay follower named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of him. With the destruction of the five lower fetters, he has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will there attain final Nibbana without returning from that world. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So just now the monk and the uh, n- uh, nuns, uh, uh, they can attain the four uh, uh, other influences, lah. the Arahan, Anagamin, Sakadagamin and Sotapanna. And I was the fourth fruit, third fruit, second and first fruit. Nah. But here you see for the layman, nah, uh, the highest nah, is the anagamin, nah, destruction of the five lower factors. Nah. He has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes. Nah. That refers to the anagamin. Nah. Uh, so the lay, layman follower nah, generally nah, uh, cannot become an arahan. Nah. Uh. And then, uh, similarly, uh, for the, the layman, uh, hears of some other layman uh, who's uh, attained the uh, Sakadagamin and Sotapanna, and then he's also inspired uh, to follow that way. Uh. And similarly, uh, a woman lay follower hears thus The woman lay follower named so and so has died. The Blessed One has declared of her, with the destruction of the five lower factors, she has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abodes and will. There attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. In other words, uh, also become an Anagamin. Uh, and so she is also inspired. Uh. Similarly, when she hears about uh, another lay w- woman follower uh, who has attained Sakadagamin and Sutapanna, uh, so she will be inspired to follow that. Uh. So, Anuruddha, it is not for the purpose of scheming to deceive people, or for the purpose of flattering people, or for the purpose of gain, honor, and renown, or with the thought, let people know me to be thus, that when a disciple has died, the Thagata declares his reappearance thus, so and so has reappeared in such a place, and so and so has reappeared in such and such a place. Rather, it is because there are faithful clansmen, inspired and gladdened by what is lofty, who, when they hear that, direct their minds to such a state, and that leads to their welfare and happiness for a long time. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Anuruddha was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, so that's the end of the Sutta. Uh, so this, this Sutta, the most important part, uh, is that uh, uh, section 6, uh, where the Buddha says, uh, as long as a person has not attained to the jhanas, uh, then uh, the five hindrances uh, will invade the mind and remain. Uh. But when a person has attained to the jhanas, uh, then uh, uh, the five hindrances uh, do not 
invade the mind and remain. Uh, the important word is remain. Uh, it does not remain anymore. Uh, no. Okay, we stop here. Anything to discuss? tell you exactly why the Buddha does not uh, mention the uh, destruction of the ten factors for the Arahan uh, but in some other sutta uh, it is clear uh, the Buddha mentioned uh, that the Arahan has destroyed the ten factors uh, uh, these uh, five lower factors uh, they are coarser, uh, coarser factors uh, those uh, the five higher factors uh, uh, a uh, 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 very uh, very fine factors la. only the arahan la, can uh, eliminate la. can you speak louder factors ah Uh, in the Vinaya books, uh, uh, when the Buddha talks about a meal, uh, uh, he talks about uh, soft food and hard foods. Uh, generally, all foods. Uh, uh, only uh, there are certain exceptions uh, 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 to that. Uh. Mm. So... Uh, the Buddha himself practiced one meal a day. La. So uh, later, because some monks found it hard, na, then the Buddha said, uh, after you take your main meal, if you want, you can set some aside na, and eat later. La. Mm. So uh, because the Buddha ate one meal, la, and it's mentioned he eats in one session or one sitting. Na. So there are some uh, forest monks, na, like in some forest monasteries in Thailand, uh, they only eat one meal a day. La. So breakfast is actually considered a meal. La. Is there a sutta that compares lower jhana to slow Lower? And lower jhana, to compare the lower jhana to slow carbon. So when the grasses are taken away, the grass will grow away. No, there's no such there's no such thing. Where did you hear that? Not in the sutta, as far as I know. Okay. Sunday, uh, in temples, I do see uh, two monks uh, uh, who are able to uh, do the uh, one thing that they do is that uh, they don't want to the right one for the left one to the right. And I see, like, more than after she, any reference. Uh, 
I can't tell you about the statues because I'm not interested in statues. <laughs> Okay, shall we end here?